The title for the sermon this morning is The Meaning of Life, Part 2. Faith does not cancel out the realities of life. However, faith does give us hope beyond hope. How many of us in this room, and I probably need a show of hands here because this will determine whether I take path A or path B in the sermon, right? So, how many of us in this room understand the phrase or the word confirmation bias? Do we know what confirmation bias is? Just be honest, if you know what it is, throw your hand up if you don't. Excellent. Path A, it is. Confirmation bias is essentially you find what you're looking for. That's really kind of the crass and, and, and you know, blunt way to put it. It is, my belief is confirmed with the biases that I possess because I will look at something and interpret it in any way I possibly can. You can find confirmation bias present on Fox News, right? You go there, and they have their thing. They're going to do it. But guess what? It's also on CNN, and it's on any other news outlet that you have there dependent upon who's paying the bill. And so there's this confirmation bias that ends up happening in uh, normal people's life, not just in major media outlets, but it ends up being you find what you look for. So if I were to tell you, find something happy, what would you do? You would probably find something happy and then interpret it as happy and follow down that road of finding what you're looking for. I could tell you to look for the color red. And then when you open up your eyes after I, you know, said, look in the room, close your eyes, you know, think about all the things that you saw were red, and then opened up and said something about, well, where's all the brown stuff? You'd be like, wait a second, I looked for the red. And so you you only see red at that point, right? No correlation to being a Republican or anything like that. Just, Just a color, right? The fact is, there's times that we do have biases that confirm what we want to believe and we want to see. Here's the kicker. Many times people will say Christianity is like that, in which we have our biases confirmed by what we want to believe because we're looking for hope and we're looking for joy and we're looking for all these things. And so we find what we are looking for. We want peace, we will find peace. And the argument by many of them is it doesn't verify the reality of what Christianity is or is not because of the confirming of your own personal biases towards a particular end. And so how do we, as Christians, answer that? How do we understand that? Because, guess what? I see confirmation bias work all the time. I see it work in my children. I see it work in the kids of the church. I see it work at everybody here. We, we unconsciously do it at times. So how do we, as Christians, say, Nuh-uh, the Christian faith is not just confirmation bias. It's not just finding what I want to find and then walking in that. It's not just a part of my culture in which I run into, but there's actual verifiable real truth and something that is more substantial than me just well-wishing. I think first and foremost, we have to understand salvation properly. We have to understand what it means to be someone who is a Christian, somebody who is born again, somebody who is actually a follower of Jesus. You did not wake up one day and just want to confirm your own biases. And so in that, you started doing what was good and right and pure and holy, following Jesus and His ways. Let me tell you how it actually worked. Your wicked little legs were carrying you as fast as you could away from Him. You weren't looking for Him. You didn't just, you know, go on this journey for Jesus and you found Him. No, He found you. He arrested you where you were at. He saved you while you were his enemy. He saved you while you were against him. He came and grabbed you. If your own personal biases were functioned within, you would continue to run away from him as fast as you possibly could. When I think about salvation and what the Word of God gives us as how God works in salvation, He saves you. He came to us. We didn't go to Him. He came to us. Jesus Christ came to seek and save that which is what? Lost. 
The lost thing didn't try to get found. The reality of it is, is the lost thing continued to be lost with everything it had in it. If we do not understand salvation in that way, then, well, confirmation bias kind of has a point. I found what I was looking for. The fact is, God found you when you were pitiable, wretched, poor, and blind. You weren't looking. Yet he opened the eyes of your heart. Opened the eyes of your understanding. He granted you life in him. As First Peter says, you were caused to be born again to a living hope that is found in him. Pretty astonishing words. I also like to think about it in terms of the story of the patriarchs. Abraham. What happened to Abraham? Did Abraham go to a church? Did he go looking for God? No. Abraham was minding his business, doing his thing, and God came to him. And then God said to him something particularly radical. Get up and leave your homeland. I'm going to make you the father of many. I am going to multiply your offspring like the stars of the sky. God gave him his promises, and God came to Abraham. And what was Abraham's response? Faith. And his faith was credited to him as righteousness. He came to follow God as God came to him and called him to respond. And here's the thing. He believed in hope against hope. What does that mean? To believe in hope against hope means when you look at all the realities surrounding his life, those realities would be speak of, well, you shouldn't trust this, Abraham. You are 75 years old, and at the time that the promise began to start to come true, he was 90, 99, 100, something like that. His wife was barren all the way through. He had not long life to live that would give him children that would number the stars in the sky. So against all odds, against all potential hope, what did he do? Well, Paul writes about this in Romans. Turn with me to Romans chapter 4. We'll get back to Ecclesiastes and the sermon will start, I promise. Romans chapter 4, starting in verse 18. These words that I'm using are the same words that the Apostle Paul used. Verse 18. In hope, he, speaking about Abraham, believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told. So shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is not an explanation of confirmation bias. Abraham was not just sitting in his tent in the near ancient eastern world just pining after, you know, I wish God would show up and, and give me these great and, and really outlandish promises. Rather, God came to him. God revealed himself to him. God then made his promises to him. And what did Abraham do? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham hoped against hope. When the world says that it is going to provide you other than what God says, who are we going to believe? God or the world? Here's the thing. Confirmation bias believes not only just what I want to believe, but it believes what the world is saying to us in our little circle. But coming to faith in Christ is different than that. Faith is different than that. Faith understands that the world is broken. Faith understands that Things are not as they should be. And yet what we do is we trust that God is going to make them as He wants them to be. He is going to renew, restore. He's going to bring life where there is no life. Where we only know death and meaninglessness and vanity and frustration. He says He is going to bring peace. 
This is where the Christian faith is more than just mere confirmation bias because it happens to be something within my culture that makes people feel good. I'm actually believing that God has redeemed, renewed, restored, and that His promises are real. I actually believe when I came to faith in Jesus Christ, that He quickened me to life and caused me to be born again. That He actually worked in the circumstances in my life to draw me to Him and to make me His. Where I'm not just looking at those things that happen in life as mere circumstances or mere happenstance or mere chances that, that fell upon me, that fell upon me in an impersonal way. No, there is a Creator in this world and He loves us. And He has worked in our lives to open the eyes of our heart that we might see the goodness of God in the face of Jesus Christ. To see His splendor and His might and His power. Here's one of the biggest problems in modern day preaching and teaching. When we talk about this faith and preachers get up there and they start sawing it hot. They get all happy, feeded and dancing about and you know, get everybody all riled up. They like to hang with that good feeling. They like to hang with that good feeling and what they begin to do is they begin to treat faith like it whitewashes reality. They like to treat faith as something in which you come to and somehow it just magically makes everything better. And the vanity and meaninglessness of life that you had before you came to Christ somehow just magically goes away. Faith does not whitewash reality. Faith does not remove the gritty reality of life. The pain that exists there, the difficulty that exists there, and that is what I love about the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes is gritty, it's raw, it's difficult. This whole second half that we're going to be going to, one of the reasons that it is difficult to have a structure for it, is because... It's proverbial in nature, and it's just like a set of Proverbs, one after another. But in it, we continue to see vanity of vanities, all is of vanity, meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. And yet, interwoven within those is the beautiful thing that there is good yet in life. That we can have joy even in the middle of the vanity that's here, and there is something that is more than under the sun. See, that's what faith leads us to. It leads us to understand that there is something more than under the sun. And if you remember from last week, under the sun is a phrase that is used 35 times within the book of Ecclesiastes to refer to the life existence of mankind here. There's more to life than just what is under the sun. There's an entire existence beyond what we have. The eternity that God has promised for us, the place that He has made for us, the things that He has built for us and awaits for us with. And Ecclesiastes implies that. Because he keeps asking these questions of, well, who can know these things? Right, who can know them? God? Can man? No, Faith isn't knowing all that there is to know. It is trusting in the one who does know. Faith doesn't bring you to a place to know all things where you all of a sudden become the one that has all the answers. Over 25 years of being a Christian, one of the things that I have been tempted to do, I have been tempted to think that I have to be the answer man. I don't know if you guys remember the Bible show, the, the, the show from Hank Hanegraaff, and he called himself the Bible, the Bible answer man. The Bible Answer Man. What a title, right? A self-given title, by the way. Well, I'm not really the Bible Answer Man, and I'm not even really the Answer Man. I sit like the rest of you, and like the author of Ecclesiastes, kind of frustrated that I don't know what tomorrow brings. Even though my weather app says that I might, it's a liar. It never really tells the full truth. It has partial truths in it. Like, yes, tomorrow's going to be coldish. And then you find out what it is actually like. The fact is, we don't know. But God does. And that is what the book of Ecclesiastes keeps trying to grip us with. We don't know tomorrow. We don't know what's coming next. 
Yet God does. So where is our faith placed? If I place my faith in my own sight, I'm in trouble. Because as much as I want to have all the answers and and know all that there is to know, the fact is I can't. I walk about like the rest of you. Stumbling about almost in the dark, but then rejoicing that God has given me what? A lamp for my feet and a light for my path. He has given me the word and he has shown light into the darkness. Even though the darkness is here by God's grace, may the gospel and his word and the truth that is there overcome the darkness. And that's where the entirety of the book of Ecclesiastes resolves. The greatest good that we have is to understand God's ways, to follow his ways. And so we're going to pick some, select some bits and pieces of proverbial statements that are here. We're going to kind of eludicate on what they say, but then we're going to find the great resolve on what the chief end is for us. What the greatest good for us is. Because I love the way it resolves. It's a very simple matter of faith. Faith in the God of heaven and earth. Faith in the one who created all that there is. Faith in the one who sent his son Jesus Christ to die for us. Trusting him and his ways, even though we don't have all the answers. And even though the answers that we do have sometimes are hard. Start with me. Chapter 6, verse 10. Whatever has come to be has already been named. And it is known what man is, and that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. You might be like, what in the world? Again, he talks in riddles, backing over himself over and again. But it is very simple. What has come to be has already been named. God knows what is coming. He is not ignorant. The future is not revealed to him in the moment and somehow he is going to be surprised by what is happening and then just have like divine super speed to deal with it properly. What's going to come has already been named. He knows it. And who's able to dispute with the one that is stronger than he? Again, talking in riddles and circles. But how many of you can take one that is stronger than you and dispute with them? We've learned that one probably a million times in our life, right? Strength is always a great thing for besting and destroying others. However, how many of us can actually wrestle with God and come out and win? How many of us are actually stronger than He? None. This is the point He makes. The more words, the more vanity. And what is the advantage to man? We can talk ourselves through it, we can talk ourselves around it, but the reality of God's sovereignty and control is undeniable, no matter how many words we put to it. For who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow? For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? And this is the rhetorical question that keeps getting asked over and again within the book of Ecclesiastes. Who, who knows what's coming next? The obvious answer is God. This is the thing that's been being presented over and again. God knows what's coming next, though man does not. Fortune tellers, fortune cookies, magic balls, magic crystal balls, whatever. The fact is, is they know nothing They play games, they act like they know, but they do not. He continues on and he begins to, in chapter 7, have this contrast of wisdom and folly. And in the contrast of wisdom and folly, he begins to say that wisdom is a great thing, and yet it's not an end-all, be-all. You can be the wisest that there ever was, and then what does the wisest that there ever was do? Has Solomon ever been an enigma to you? He is to me. He asked God to be the wisest there ever was. And then what does Solomon do? The very thing that God says not to do. What does Solomon do? The very thing that Solomon himself, as the preacher, is telling them to do. He he doesn't do it. He doesn't keep God's commands and ways. He married a bunch of foreign wives. He set up altars on the high places for their gods. And at the end of his life, he began to worship them. Is that what God wanted? God wanted that monogamy, and yet... Solomon was unwilling to provide it. And he was the wisest that there ever was. God said, do not multiply chariots and horses. And what did he do? He had entire store cities for just the chariots and horses. 
for being the wisest that there, wisest that there ever was, it seems like there was a lot of folly. And that's what he begins to contrast here. I, I think this is an aged Solomon expressing these things as the person who wrote this and put this together kind of saw the teaching that he had and the vexation that he had, not seeing wisdom as being, well, this saving reality. Because sometimes we think, well, if I'm wise enough, I can do this on my own. If I'm wise enough, I will be strong enough to do the things that please God. But the fact is, is even wisdom is vain. But as he compares folly and wisdom, which is greater? Well, for sure, wisdom. Just because there is a vanity to wisdom, does that mean we should plunge down into folly? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. There is this beauty to wisdom that he presents here over and again. Jump down to verse 11 in chapter 7. Wisdom is good with an inheritance, an advantage to those who see the sun. For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money. And the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the life of him who has it. Consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? I like that question. Who can change how God has made it? Who can undo what God has done? Who can undo what God has said? The, the, the obvious answer is no one. And so wisdom being the very thing that God created with, check out Proverbs chapter 8, wisdom was there in the beginning in God's very creative acts. Wisdom is still a good thing even though there is a vanity and a meaningless to it. Wisdom is something that we should pursue. In the day of prosperity, be joyful. And in the day of adversity, consider this. God has made the one as well as the other, so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. In my vain life, I have seen everything. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness. And there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. Consider the day of prosperity and be joyful. Consider the goodness of wisdom. These are things in which we should take distinct joy in, that we should be happy about, but then also realize that the way that God works in this life is even if you stand with wisdom and have that righteousness and do all these things, you may still suffer the path of Job. Have you ever considered that? Sometimes when we look at people as they're covered in their proverbial boils of suffering and loss and pain, we go, <laughs> what did they do to make God mad? That may not be the exact inner dialogue that you have, but it's still the sentiment and emotion that we have at times as we judge one another, and we obviously see the person who's poor and downcast and struggling with those things as, well, less righteous. But the fact is, is the righteous man is still going to suffer the same, and there are wicked men who do what? Who prosper. Who prosper beyond measure and means, and you sit there and you ask, Why? Why, when they do all of those things, do they have so much given to them? What is the statement? Both these are from God. This is why it is good to just take the cup that God has given you and rejoice in the things that are there. Be happy with who you are and where you're at. Pastor Paul used to always say, oh, I want, I want the trial or the struggle of wealth, you know. And he was joking, of course. You know, he would then joke about having, you know, beachfront ministry in the Bahamas or something like that. And I used to be like, yeah, that'd be ah, suffering for Jesus on the beach, you know. But the fact is, I don't want it if God doesn't have it for me. I, I, don't, I don't want to have that trial of wealth. I've got enough problems. Why, why add more to me? Why, why add... The, the, the trial and temptation that would be to hang out in the Bahamas. Because you know what I would do if I was in the Bahamas? Other than swelter half to death and melt away into nothing because I hate the heat. Um, 
But let's just say I like that kind of thing. I'd probably get lost in fishing and hanging out on the beach and doing things where I'd have to justify and be like, oh, this is ministry. Right? Don't necessarily have that temptation here because there's not many crappie running around, right? Fact is, is God has placed you where he has placed you and he has set you in the time he has set you. And the various things that you suffer in your life or that you have prosperity in should be seen to be what they are as God has given them to you. And this, I believe, is the point that Solomon is trying to drag us through. Righteousness does not necessarily bring us about prosperity, as some would have us to think. Prosperity comes from the Lord, and even calamity comes from Him. Where do you find yourself to be? Are you trusting in the Lord? Are you trusting in God in the middle of all of those struggles? And are you seeing His mighty hand work even through the circumstances of calamity that might happen to be right smack dab in the middle of your life? That's a beautiful thing that Solomon gives us over and again is for us to see God for who He is and trust His goodness. Though we cannot fully know His ways. Chapter 8, verse 14. Turn with me there. Chapter 8, verse 14. There is a vanity that takes place on earth that there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. And there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deed of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity, and I commend joy. For man has nothing better under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful. For this will go, for this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. Let's stop right there for just a second. It's not just saying, don't worry, be happy, but it's kind of saying, don't worry, be happy. Why? Because you're trusting in the one who knows the end from the beginning. Whatever your hand finds to do, whatever it might be, find that joy. Sometimes we think our joy is going to be changing of a circumstance, a a going to a different job, or maybe a different spouse. Or maybe a different state. Or maybe a different fill-in-the-blank, whatever it might be for you that just popped into your head right now. A different house, doesn't matter. Different car. The fact is, when you get any one of those things, you will still be you and you will still be there. You know, when I was pastoring in another state and in another church, you know the biggest problem that I had in that church? Me. Me. And you know what the problem that I brought with me when I got here? Me. When we begin to realize that wherever we are at, there we are, and wherever God has placed us, and I know it sounds overly, stupidly simple, but it is wonderfully profound that we might be able to find joy with wherever we're at. And this brings me to that passage where Paul is singing in chains. He's in prison, and he's singing praises to God. And I've told you more than once, I want to know what that is. I think it founds from this. Trusting in God's sovereign goodness, that no matter what is happening around you, you can praise the King and find joy in life. Why? Because there is a God up in heaven who loves you and cares for you. And it doesn't matter when or where. And I have seen that in your lives repeatedly. I have prayed for so many of you guys over and over and over again and watch God work. Watch God save, redeem, restore, deliver. Watch God move in people's hearts and minds to change them to be what they were not and what they could not make themselves. You begin to see God work even in the midst of pain and frustration. As I walk with you guys, I see God moving. And I praise Him. And I see the vanity and the meaningless of life right alongside with you. And there's many times people come and be like, Pastor, I've I've got this and this and this and that going on. And I'll be like, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, don't you have anything to say? And I'm like, nope, just trying to not cry. 
Is that all you got? Yep, I'll go pray for you. Why? Because I don't know what tomorrow brings, and I don't know the things that are there, and I feel the vexation and the meaninglessness right along with you. And yet I trust the one who knows the end from the beginning. Yet I trust the one who has made all things. And I seek to simply enjoy my life with the ones whom I love. Chapter 7, verse 9. Go eat your bread with joy, and drink your wine with a merry heart. For God has already approved what you do. Stop right there. There's a handful of things to be said about that. It doesn't say God has already approved whatever you want to do, right? I'm going to go rob a bank this afternoon. Anybody with me? It's not what he means. However, he is talking about these realities of function within our lives. God has created food for us to eat and wine for us to drink. Find joy in doing those things. Not to excess in which it is going to bring you to death, but in such a manner where you can be thankful for the bread and for the wine and the merry heart that is given. I don't know about you, but Thanksgiving almost always ruins me. And it takes like a whole month to maybe get back on track. But there is a particular joy that I have begun to find over the years just simply in eating one plate and being okay with it rather than like six plates and trying to destroy whatever's happening in here, right? And I can find pleasure in that time and not pay for six days afterwards because the amount of sugar that I then took into my system. And so I'm simply learning and growing as a human on this earth that there is even meaning and, and meaninglessness and vanity in that, and yet I can still find great joy in that time and look forward to those moments. God wants us to find joy in those things that we have and do. Let your garments always be white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. What does that mean? Take care of yourself. There is nothing innately holy or good about some minimalist existence. If I have oil on my head, that means I am, I've got beauty product. You know, man, man beauty product. I've got clean clothes, I've bathed, I've taken care of myself. I don't know about you, but after getting all nasty and soiled and dirty and all that stuff, there's great pleasure in doing that. Enjoy that, that's cool. It's good for you. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love. All the days of your life, your vain life, that He has given you under the sun. Because that is your portion in life. In your toil, at which you toil under the sun. And I started thinking, well, there's women in this room, so they have husbands. And there's widows in this room, and so they once had spouses. And then there's single folks in this room who've never had spouses. And there's all kinds of people in this room. So what does this mean? Is this only for the men in the room? Everybody else has to fall asleep for the next 20 seconds as we get through this point? No. It is essentially a proverbial statement that points to love the ones you're with. Whoever you're at and whatever lot God has given you, whatever portion God has placed you in, whatever position in life you are in, there needs to be relationships that you have. If you are alone, I'm I'm sorry. I really am. But there are people sitting in this room. Grab a hold of some of them. They might be jerks just like you, but grab a hold of them anyway. And, and love them. In any relationship that you have, there, there's ample opportunities for us to have people that will benefit and bless us. And I'm telling you, being in relationship with people is hard. But it is good. It, it's good. And so love the ones you're with. Whomever you're with, love them. Love them in the name of Christ. Love them with the best that you can. Because this is your portion in life and in your toil. Those relationships come in and through toil as we toil. We somehow have this idea placed within our culture that these relationships are going to be magical and easy and those are the ones that I need to look for. If you find that one, run away from it. It's probably the devil. 
Because all of us are imperfect, terribly so. And yet, merciful, kind, gathering together, loving one another, encouraging one another, and finding joy in that. I want to find joy in this gathering. I want to find joy in many other gatherings. I want to find excuses to get together with you because I love you and and have an enjoyment with you so much. And what stops that is your own judgment and your own self. What stops that in our midst is the own things that drag us away. Whatever your hand finds to do, verse 10, do it with your might. For there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. Work. It's what God created us to do. It became a four-letter word. And it shouldn't be. Christ has redeemed it. Find joy in the particular tasks that God has given you. Rejoice and be thankful. And understand that life is meant to be joyed enjoyed and wisdom is better than folly this is the entire point that he makes over and over and over again if you get the time continue to scan through you're going to see lots of proverbial statements towards that end encouraging us in particular directions to see the nature of wisdom and the nature of folly the superiority of that and where god would have us to be but the place that i'm going to take us to last is chapter 12 In chapter 12, he begins to resolve this entire book. And he starts out with a most beautiful phrase. Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth. Before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. We've heard the phrase before, youth is wasted on the young, right? Or something along those lines. And when you get older, and and then even older, you start to wish that you had the vigor of youth, and you wouldn't waste the things that you wasted. And I love this statement, while you are young, while you're young, young folks, give mind to your Creator. Pay attention to the fact that there is a Creator. And don't waste youth. We live in a generation and in an age in which our youth have been targeted by the mass marketing just firms which they believe that the best sales and the most money that they can make is going to be from these kids. Because as you get older, you start to not spend your money in the same way that kids want to. You're not as susceptible to the bright and shiny because you've been there, done that, had that, don't want to waste my time. And yet the kids, what do they do? They latch on to it. They grab onto it. This is the greatest thing ever. This is, and what they end up doing is eating gravel, and it's terrible. The admonition and the warning here is before life becomes difficult, before you have no pleasure in them. Old folks in the room, do things taste like they used to? Can you smell things like you once did? Now, th- this might be a good thing, Right? Not being able to smell, you know, especially for Miss Trish. She doesn't come in and smell my office, you know, like, what are you doing in here? She's never had that thought. It's wonderful. The fact is, is as you get older and older, there ceases to be that pleasure in life, the good things that are there. And so while you are young, don't waste that youth. And I'm not saying go out and get all you can with the youth. I'm saying fear God and follow his ways. That is our greatest good, which he resolves in, in verse 9 and following. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads and like nails, firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of the making of many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness to the flesh. 
the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Fear God and keep his commandments. Fear God and keep his ways. Fear God and follow him. That is really the basic command that starts at very first verse in that chapter. Remember your creator. Fear him. If we are remembering our creator, what are we understanding about our creator? If he created us, he can uncreate us. Right? And I better fear the one that can not only kill my body, but cast my soul into outer darkness. It's ironic how we fear men so much. And yet we do not give due fear to God. And the beauty of it is He has given us His ways. He has revealed to us His ways. He's revealed them in the person of Jesus Christ. He's revealed them in His most holy word. And so when it talks about these words of the wise that are like firmly fixed nails and goads, the picture that is being presented here is the nails and goads that stick out of the back of what was pulled with an oxen. I don't know exactly what to call it, but you know how the oxen are set up and pulling a cart or a plow. They have you know, their rigs on and everything over their shoulders, and back behind them was a bar that went back behind their feet. And if they lagged, these goads would come down and hit them in the heels. And what would that do to an ox? Well, you get stabbed in the butt with a sharp goad or nail, and you're motivated to go forward, right? And so these words are supposed to be like that. These words that are preached here are supposed to be like that. They're supposed to spur us on to love and good works. They're supposed to spur us on to live as we should. They're supposed to spur us on as creatures under the gaze of the Creator. Understanding who He is and what He has done. Following His ways and seeking His face. Looking for things beyond what is under the sun. That is the end of all these matters here. Hear His Word. Fear His name. Keep His commandments. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. And so what are we doing in that? I don't believe this is a portion of the Scripture that is advocating for us to be as righteous as possible because we've already gone through the failures of righteousness. We've already gone through the fact that even the most righteous that there is still has sin. So what are we doing here? Why is he encouraging us in this way? Well, why it's not as direct as it is in other passages, I think it is simply telling us to trust him in his ways. Trust him in his ways, trust him in his promises, trust what he has revealed to us in his word. And what has he revealed to us in his word? Well, he revealed that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sin. Jesus Christ, the Creator, came down, made Himself man, did not create or did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but came down and was treated ignobly by sinful mankind and then bore on the cross your sin and my sin, bore our iniquity, bore the things on His shoulders that we cannot bear ourselves. And then when he died, putting himself to the grave, he rose again. And he sits ruling on high. And he calls us to follow his ways. He calls us to follow the things that he has placed in front of us. And how else am I going to follow them unless I am pursuing them most constantly? Unless I am letting those words be goads and nails to my hinder parts, driving me forward. Christian, it's real simple. Unbeliever, it's real simple. Trust Jesus. Follow Him. And you're like, you say that all the time, Johnson. Like, yes, I do. But here's what I don't say all the time. Every person sitting in this room right now is not here by chance. Every person sitting in this room right now is not here because of some, you know, mysterious alignment of juju in the universe. I believe God has each person in here today on purpose. 
for a reason. For God to speak to you through His Word and to encourage you in the place that you need it. And that we together in Christ might respond to these things. I've prayed all week, and I pray every week for you guys. That God would grant repentance, that God would turn your faces to Him, that God would work in your life, that God would allow you to find joy in such a miserable and meaningless world. I pray for you most constantly. So as we sit here, ask God, what is my response? How should I respond to this? Sometimes people respond critically. Sometimes people respond uh, apathetically. Sometimes people respond by, I'm glad that's over. I might not be back next week. Johnson was getting after it too much. None of those should be our responses. Our responses should be, Lord, what do you have for me? Hopefully some of it is encouragement. Hopefully some of it is rebuke. And hopefully some of it is that you just continue to regard and consider your Creator and hear the chief end that has been placed before us. Fear God and keep His commandments because everything is going to be brought into judgment one day and nobody is going to hide from it. There's no getting away from it. So do you know Jesus? Good. Run after Him. If you don't, grab somebody sitting next to you and say, hey man, I need to know Jesus. Ask Him and they will lead you. Father, we thank you for a morning to gather in the name of Christ. And I pray that you'd work in our hearts and minds and that we would see your holy guidance, your sovereign goodness, and how you work, and how it was you that came and arrested us and redeemed us and restored us and saved us. May we be ever thankful for your work in our life, even in the mundane circumstances that exist around us. Father, bless us. I thank you for my brothers and sisters here this morning, and I pray that as we sing to you, that your name would be praised and that we, together in Christ, would make much of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.